What does it mean to have no address? No address equals unemployment, no housing, no education, no place to call home, criminalization of innocent people, not a part of society. Though having an address equals solutions. This is the No Address Podcast. Welcome to our podcast where we break down the philosophy of having no address and what that really means. I am your host, Kalita Harris, and this podcast is an extension to the documentary series which depicts the criminalization of homelessness, the causes of homelessness, and practical solutions. We are back today with part two of No Address Podcast with Max Parthas, and we are discussing the prison industrial complex and its correlation with the criminalization of homelessness. So we're gonna continue the conversation because I really wanna get to the solutions and how we all can get involved because there are real solutions and we do need to have our demands in order before we present it to anyone. And this will go across the board throughout the country. So let's get right into it. Did you know, for instance, that of the homeless population throughout the nation, 70% of them are men. Of those 70%, 40% are black men. Black men only make up 6% of the population, and yet they represent 40% of the homeless population. That is the same exact statistics that we have in the prison. And I bet you if you dig a little deeper and you look at poverty as a whole, you'll find those same stats there as well. Oh, definitely. I was listening to the webinar on the National Law Center for Homelessness and Poverty, and they were talking about COVID and the criminalization as, you know, housing is a right. And their statistic was that 60% nationwide are homeless black people. Mm -hmm. And so prison, poverty, uh, homelessness, and even COVID, it's the same thing, which is why I said earlier today that I'm convinced that in any area where black people make up the majority of those suffering the consequences of national policy, it is treated with apathy primarily for that reason. Even in a play, mm-hmm. prison and poverty, homelessness, the stats are nearly identical in each system. Six percent make up forty percent. So apparently, some will never agree that Black Lives Matter. On the contrary, some will actively seek to snuff out their lives and remove them in the prisons for profit and control. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what happened through this exception clause, which says that slavery is abolished in the United States and all its territories, except for prisoners duly convicted. And that right there removes all of your rights constitutionally and as a human being. So once you become convicted of a crime, you are literally not property of the state. You are owned and operated by the state. Your 14th Amendment are no longer exists. Your 15th Amendment no longer exists. You've been disenfranchised as many millions have. Well, you can't even vote anymore for a system that you're going to be paying taxes in <laughs> after you get out of prison. Yeah, they so won't you, exempt that, will they? Right, and that's a lifelong uh, punishment, what we call collateral consequences, for a felony that is not a lifelong t- punishment. So <laughs> collateral consequences are following you the rest of your life. There's something like 7 million people who cannot vote right now because of convictions uh, and serving time in jail. And the reason is the 13th Amendment, because you're no longer now a citizen. You are, even after you get out, still property of the state. Yeah. And this is the thing. Everything is a crime now. (laughs) So you can be property of the state. Like some of these ordinances just came about. And some have been in existence forever, but then some of them are just getting more attention now, you know, or they're enforcing it more now versus, you know, a decade ago. They probably didn't do too much with loitering. They didn't do too much with panhandling. Now, they didn't do too much with you just sleeping in your car. Now, every single thing is a crime. I remember uh, one of the premier district attorney, state district attorneys in the United States was explaining the circumstances that you're referring to, saying that we have created so many laws now that any given moment, any given day, there are 150 million people in this country who can be considered criminals. At any given moment, 150 million people, Mm. because of the numbers of laws, 
uh, that we put on the books. And many of those laws, as we just spoke about earlier, trace back to the black code and our racially uh, biased laws. You know, racial hatred, racial bias creates fuel. And that fuel can be monetized. And people do monetize it. They literally are making fortune off this illusion called race. And they feed you these ridiculous propaganda-fueled uh, logical fallacies like black-on-black crime, for instance, uh, where, you know, they'll point out, what about black-on-black crime? How can it possibly be that there is only one example in the entire human language about race-on-race crime? <laughs> None of it is mentioned. How is that possible? Yeah, we're the only ones, we're the only race committing crime. <laughs> right. So it's a, it demonizes us through this propaganda when the truth of it is that 95% of people who are killed, uh, white people who are killed, are killed by other whites in white communities. And I, I think it's reversed, 87% are whites and 95% are blacks. But the moral of that story is the crime happens in the communities you live in. So if you live in a black community, there's going to be black people doing the crimes more than likely than not, and vice versa. Mm-hmm. But it's propaganda to feed us this uh, singularity that seems to exist in a vacuum with no counterpart. If you're going to talk about black on black crime, we should be talking about white on white crime and all the other ethnic on uh, ethnic crime. Yeah, and stop singling us out for everything, because I'm tired of being a statistic for everything negative. Why are we paying for somebody to be in a cage that is not a criminal? It's very cunning, isn't it? Yeah. If you were Dr. Evil, it would be a brilliant idea. Oh, well, well, apparently most of them are. Because my thing is, to put somebody in jail to be homeless, just because whatever reasons you have that you don't like someone that's unsheltered, that just does not have a home, and whatever stereotype you want to put on that as that individual. But you should be outraged that you are paying this prison, this institution that's sick, to house somebody, you're paying all their bills, basically, but you can be putting a homeless person in a home. One company owned by the United States government called Unicor does nothing but provide prison labor. And through that prison labor, it generates a billion dollars a year in revenue. And that's just one company. Mm -hmm. So we can say that a lot of the products are probably made and manufactured or produced or created or whatever in America by the prison population for the same yeah. amount that you would take it overseas for or less. Yes. Yes. It, it was a transfer. If you remember in, back in the 70s and 80s, a lot of our jobs went overseas. So mm-hmm. we fought during the civil rights movement to get these jobs and those jobs were given to us and we did okay for about 20 years and then they started sending them to places like Korea and uh, China, and whatever people would work for a dollar a day in order to exploit that cheap labor and to get rid of jobs that we had fought so hard to get. Well, those jobs came back, and they came back to the prison. They didn't come back to the populace. They came back to the prison. Mm. So rather than now having China making certain goods, they'll have them made in the prison. There was one story where the prisoners themselves were making the American flags that are sold all over the world. <laughs> the prisoners mm. are making American flags being sold all over the world. If that's the most, not the most hypocritical, ironic thing you can imagine, then what is? Do you all hear the connections here? Like, everything's connected to something, and it's all destruction at the end of the day. It's not in favor for humanity at all. Your voice is either you have a voice for the voiceless or you have a voice for those screaming out saying, we control this and we can control you too. I think personally, and I reflect the thoughts of many other slavery abolitionists across the country, we believe that if we solve this problem, the other problems that surround it, like the homelessness and the poverty, will also be handled in the wake of that. Mm -hmm. But you can't fix any of that as long as slavery is going on. My thing is, how can people get involved? What, what advice would you give the people out here now? Because it seems like there's a lot of young people. They're starting to feel it. The energy is moving. 
you have to remove the exception clause from the state constitutions first. There are 24 states, or 23 states now, that have exceptions to slavery in their state constitution, allowing them to practice legalized slavery, which they do. Colorado was the first state to remove that exception to slavery uh, since in 377 years, literally. Since Massachusetts became the first British colony to legalize slavery, Colorado became the first state to make it illegal, and that took 377 years. Wow. But since then, we've gotten eight more states on board who are actively moving towards removing their exception clause. Our goal is to get all 24 of them. Now, once we get this in play, which is already occurring as we speak, the next step is move into a constitutional convention or a congressional convention or either an Article 5 convention of states where we repeal the 13th Amendment and replace it with a new amendment, likely the 28th Amendment, that simply says the same thing without the 14 words that allow for slavery. So it'll say slavery in the United States has been abolished in all its territories, period. period. No exception at all. Period. So once you do this, now slavery is illegal. It's no longer protected by the Constitution. The courts can no longer point at you and go, well, it says right here in the 13th Amendment that we can do this. They can't do that anymore. So if you're existing in slave-like conditions, if you're being treated like a slave, if your life inside these prison walls are at, as a slave, you can challenge that in court now. And you don't have the 13th Amendment stopping you from challenging these crimes against humanity. So that would create huge amounts of lawsuits at every level of society that the system will have to fight against without that protection any longer. Oh, yeah. And then the overall goal at the end of that is to see about 70% of the people who are behind bars free because they have no business being there. They should have never been in a jail cell to begin with. As you said earlier, many of them are either crimes of poverty, drug-related, uh, addiction-related, or uh, some of the most mon mundane things that you can imagine. In 2017, more people were arrested for personal possession of marijuana than all violent crimes combined. Those people have no business in prison, mm -hmm. and they need to be free. So our goal is to see about 70% of those people free. Now, with 70% of the prisoners free, you also have to cut down on the police force, because if you don't have slavery, you don't need slave catchers. So you'll need only 30% of the police force now. Because you're no longer hunting people for profit. It'll change our country as we know it. And it will spread across the globe. Because the prison industries here in the United States, the for-profit private prison industries, are the largest corporations on earth. They employ more people on three continents than any other company on earth. And I'm talking about G4S, Geo Group, and uh, Core City. Those three are huge conglomerates that circle the globe. When I say they are the largest co corporations in the world, I literally mean that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, G4S is the largest employer on the entire continent of Africa and has been so for the past seven years. The largest employer, a prison company. Look that up, G4S, you all, and Geo Group. And they didn't exist prior to the 1994 crime bill, which brought all these prison companies into uh, the power that they have now. So they went from nothing in 94 to now being the largest corporation on earth. And we allow that to happen. So tell me how you feel about the demonstrations that are going on now and what can, can they do to really implement change? As far as the demonstrations that are going on right now, I salute them. Uh, I pray for their safety, not only because of the police, but because we're in a pandemic. Protect yourself while you're out there. Wear your mask, don't get too close to people. Remember, it's not just your safety you're looking after. It's your mother's safety, your granddaughter's safety, uh, your baby's safety, your sister's safety. Everybody's susceptible if you get infected. Mm -hmm. So please be careful out there. But this is a necessary thing that we must do, and people are risking their lives to do it. So I applaud them for that. Me personally, I can't get out there right now. I just survived death myself, and I have a very weak immune system, so I can't afford it at this point. No, and so you've, done, like you've done a lot. <laughs> as long as you're using your voice and doing things behind the scene and keeping it going, you don't have to be out there on the street. You're, you're yeah, moving differently. We're moving differently, and we're older, so we have to think about it. You know, like the same old, same old isn't going to work anymore. 
it's not going to work anymore. So, yes, I applaud them. I think they're doing the right thing. I'm also very concerned for their safety in regards to the anarchists who are taking advantage of the protest in order to create chaos and as much destruction as possible. That's not us doing that. We're out there trying to get justice for our people. We've always been trying to get justice for our people. This is not our history of burning and looting and all these things going down. There's always elements that see these as opportunities to do that. And right now they are doing it. Uh, so when you start pointing fingers, make sure you keep these two issues separate. Thank you. Uh, Don't be blaming it on us because you just see our face in the news. We are not, I mean, some may be, but everybody is not causing this destruction that's black. Right. So now people are gathered. Uh, the world is watching because now we have other countries on board now. <laughs> Salute. I give thanks for that. You know, other countries seeing because other countries got black people too. All over, black people are all over the world. Okay. So uh, they I, I understand, and they've been discriminated because of the color of their skin. So they get it now. And and this is a global movement. And so now, you know, the eyes and ears of the masses are open. What what are some steps that they okay. can take to, and what should they be asking for? Because are there really demands, or are we just chanting? Like, what should they really be trying to change here? Uh, that is a very easy answer. Uh, and, and I know this is going to sound very simple, but the simple things are the most powerful. Mm-hmm. First thing you can do is change your damn mind about what you're dealing with. Mm-hmm. Stop getting out here talking about mass incarceration and uh, racism in the courts and all of these different things that you think are the problem. They are just symptoms of a bigger problem. Mm-hmm. The real problem is legalized slavery through the 13th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. So change your mind about what you're dealing with. You're not dealing with mistakes over time. You're not dealing with errors in judgment. You are dealing with a system that was specifically created to do exactly what it's doing right now and is working like a well-oiled machine and always has been. You are the fuel that drives it. So change your mind. That's the very first thing. The second thing is seek out information. Knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. Isn't that what Frederick Douglass told us? And we happen to be able to provide lots of information for understanding in our radio program uh, available at abolitiontoday.org. So you can just go and listen to some of the things that we're saying there. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, look at the movie that Kalita just put out. I mean, I mean, take a look at the film. She breaks down a lot of this in there and what's happening specifically to the homeless community. And it's heartbreaking. Because, you know, as I said in our last conversation, some of the people who were involved in this film didn't look to see the end of it. And it wasn't because they were homeless, it was because they didn't have health insurance. So basic things that anybody else would have been able to survive, they died from. Yeah, exactly. Being in the elements, being, you know, not having the resources that they should have as human beings, period. And not say you got to pay for everything. You got to pay to be healthy. You got to pay to live. You got to pay to be when this is not the reason we were put on this planet. We all have a purpose. And I feel like we all have the same purpose is how you use your gifts and talents to get there. And it's all about uplifting humanity and changing and being in harmony with nature. There was a third thing that they can do too. Uh, There's a lot of people that I have been fighting this for a very long time and they need help. Uh, and if you want to help, you can always reach out to us at abolition center, abolitionist center at gmail.com. We accept dom- donations. We're a 5016C3 nonprofit organization. And we, our main goal is to help provide education, resource, and development in the case of uh, educating people on the abolitionist movement of today as well as of the past. But like you said, ultimately, you have to take that clause out of the 13th Amendment because this is how they're getting away with killing our brothers and sisters in cold blood in front of everybody. In front of everybody. Everybody. Um, and and so the- so I, I want to ask, how do they do that? Will, will they just, you know, get the information from you and you all help them organize how to do that? Or... Can they kind of do something in their small pockets and groups now to educate? If they want to do something in their small pockets and groups right now, you have to start with educating yourself. You just can't pick up a scalpel and start operating like you're a doctor. Mm-hmm. You have to start educating yourself. 
if you know, you, have, you don't know what you don't know. And trust me, there's a lot you don't know. Mm-hmm. So start with education. Uh, we need help. But we need people who, who know what they're doing and get out here and, and not get the wrong stories. Yes. Um, I, would, I would like to read a quote from Frederick Douglass for your audience, if you don't mind. Go ahead. It really brings things into perspective. Mm-hmm. This is something that I would say 99% of your listening audience has never heard. In 1888, Frederick Douglass delivered his most important speech in Washington, D.C. on the anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. He had spent the last couple of decades traveling to North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia to see with his own eyes what had become of his people. And during this speech, he denounced the emancipation as a stupendous fraud, saying that they had duped everybody and that the slavery had never ended. As a matter of fact, they had more power over us now than they did in chattel slavery. And this is what he had to say about what people thought at the time. He said, Every northerner, every northern man who visits the old master class, the landowners and the landlords of the South is told by the old slaveholders with a great show of virtue that they are glad that they are rid of slavery and would not have the slave system back if they could, that they are better off than they ever were before and much more of the same tenor. Thus, northern men come home duped and go on a mission of duping others by telling the same pleasing story. There are very good reasons why these people would not have slavery back if they could. Reasons far more credible to their cunning than to their conscience. With slavery, they had some care and responsibility for the physical well-being of their slaves. Now they have a firm grip on the freedman's labor as when he was a slave and without any burden for caring for his children or himself. The whole arrangement is stamped with awe and is supported by hypocrisy and are here and now on this emancipation day denounce it as a villainous swindle and invoke the press, the pulpit, and the lawmaker to assist in exposing it and blotting it out forever. He was talking about the Emancipation Proclamation that he had put into place and found out 26 years later that they had bamboozled us all with that exception. Mm-hmm. They got the cattle and the capitalists. Right. They didn't have to take care of kids anymore. You know, they had to keep us in good condition. Raise our children so they didn't die. Now they just snatch you up, put you in a jail cell, and if one dies, they'll get another. They don't care about your kids, your family, your community. None of that matters to them. Mm-hmm. All that matters is they feel that bed. And when that bed is empty, another one will come just as quick to put it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How do you start by ending slavery? Already in progress. We're in, uh, working with state legislators to remove exception clauses from their state constitution. Tennessee is already on the books. They've already proved it through Congress. It's got to go through the Senate. It's got to be voted for. Uh, and that's going to happen in 2022. In 2021, Arkansas is going to be on the books. We've also got, uh, I think it's uh, Vermont that's looking to do it. Maryland's looking to do it. We're partnering with legislators who are putting it up as a voter initiative. So all you have to do is talk to the legislators. And they will present it as, if they agree, to put it up as a voter initiative, and then all you have to do is vote on it. They can call up their legislators themselves. If nobody in your state is trying to do this, call the legislators. Hey, did you know about the state constitution here in the state of, let's give an example, say Georgia, because Georgia has a very wicked exception clause to prison, I mean to slavery in its uh, state constitution. In their state constitution, they say that slavery is abolished in the state of Georgia, except prisoners duly uh, uh, do convicted and in the case of contempt of court. So they can make you a slave for contempt of court. What? So if you're in Georgia and nobody's trying to remove that from the state constitution, call your legislator right here. Hey, here's what it says in our constitution. We should do something about that. There's no reason why we should have this language in our constitution. It's pro-slavery. Let's take it out. It's 2020. Why do we have pro-slavery language in our state docket. Mm-hmm. It's a very simple process, but you need the bravery to be able to, A, first recognize what the problem is, be able to write out something halfway decent, and then send it to your legislators in the state of Georgia or whatever state you're in that has an exception clause. Do you have I, templates prepared? Do I have a template prepared? Uh, yeah, we use Colorado's template, so I can give you that information as well as the full list of states that still have pro-slavery language in their state hospitals. Okay. 
Yeah, that'd be good. So I know you've been working on South Carolina. How is that coming? Well, that's what I was actually going to say. Uh, uh, for me, we're setting up uh, a scenario here where people can come from other states and learn from it. So we're almost finished the construction of the Paul Puffy Abolitionist Center. Uh, just two days ago, we finished all the major construction, the painting's all done. <gasps> now it's just a matter of small stuff and furnishing it. And once we have this physical location set up, we'll start inviting leaders from all over the country to come down and discuss these issues to teach them about the facts and then have them go out to their states and be able to enact these required uh, changes that we're pushing for. So within the next month, I'd say, we will be uh, beginning that process of bringing here people here from all over the country, educating them, uh, giving them the tools necessary to cause this change and then letting them go change it. That is fantastic. I'm so excited. And that's going to be in Sumter or where? Sumter, South Carolina. Yes, Sumter, South Carolina. Well, you right keep here. me posted on that so I can keep the audience posted because we need that. We need that safe haven and a, a place to just think and hash it all out right. and no distractions, you know. So we're hoping to create a model where we're doing this here in South Carolina. You can do the same thing in New Jersey and the same thing in California and set up a location we start training and developing leaders for the future who go out to make a real change about the source of our problem and not continue to address the symptoms that come with it. Yes. Yes. I agree. And that's going to take a lot of education for you to get it. Because we're talking, we talking law. And a lot of people are literate when it comes to law. So you can't fight the enemy if you don't know what you're fighting for. But this information has been hidden from them on purpose. So exactly. when you provide it, then suddenly everything comes together. It all comes and together because you've already it seen it, but you just didn't know how, how it all yeah. began and, and the systematic part of it, you know? But you see it. Right. But you didn't know that it was really legal in a sense. In, in every sense, it's illegal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. The Constitution says... Except for prisoners duly convicted, that means the minute you're convicted, guess what you are? A slave of the state, owned and operated by the state. This is the time now. People are fired up. This is the time. So it's like, let's harness that energy and put it into something positive. Put it into this movement. So now we have have a, a, a guide. <laughs> and that's what we needed. And like I said, I'm, I'm glad you were in this because abolitionists has never stopped. And hopefully we can um, have to not call ourselves abolitionists anymore because it won't even exist. I haven't had a day off in almost 30 years. Damn. I haven't had a vacation to go anywhere in 20 years. I've been working on this day in and day. Even when I was laying on my deathbed, I was working on this, trying to get it done. So I dream of the day where I don't have to try to do this no more. Mm -hmm. Where my people are free and they're not hunted in the streets. And we don't have to worry about the uh, slave catchers trying to take us and put us into a jail or prison for profit. But my children are not subject to one in three young black males ending up in prison. That is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I, I, can't, I can't imagine telling my grandchildren, and I have 18 grandchildren, mm -hmm. I cannot imagine saying to them, you know, well, my father, you going to prison. Can you imagine telling your children that? Mm -hmm. But we've seen other movements come and go who did not have the whole story and were misleading people about what to do as a solution. Mm. We watched the Black Lives Matter rise and fall. We watched the Hands Up, Don't Shoot movement rise and fall. We watched a dozen different other movements who did not have the proper knowledge or proper uh, tools to solve the problem stand up as the leaders of our community. So we've been here all along, plugging away at it and getting victory after victory. Now we need as much help as possible. Yes. 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 Did y'all hear that? We're going to follow this brother, him and brother Youssef, um, co-host of the show, abolitiontoday.org. And to follow the movement and get involved to educate and enlighten yourself, send an email to abolitionistcenter at gmail.com. Exactly. I do want to recommend two documentaries to watch, and that is 13th with Ava DuVernay, director. 
awesome awesome documentary breaks it down from oh my gosh and the numbers are astonishing and what's so even more crazy is that the numbers on homelessness is exceeds that (laughs) so Uh much more so do you understand how much they can profit from using just that population like really really so in the second documentary i want to recommend is no address documentary of course my documentary it is streaming now on xld network app or you can get the direct link on my website at noaddressdocumentary.com so watch yeah. that and and see how this system has been set up and this system has been set up and you see and you tell me what the correlation is if you see a difference or not but it's if all I have one more one more movie to that list yeah uh, you can Slavery by Another Name, mm-hmm. uh, which is available for free on PBS. Uh, if you watch that first and then watch 13th, you have a real good understanding of how we got here and where we came from. And don't forget to watch No Address. Uh, not only because uh, it's one of my favorite people is the uh, executive producer <laughs> of the film, but because it's that damn good. It really approaches the situation from a logical standpoint, and it's heartbreaking. So I appreciate your presence and your wife's presence, Tribal. Give a shout out to my sister, Tribal Uh Rain, for gracing us with awesome poetry and your story of what you experienced um, and and was told from a a woman that you know that that fell victim to criminalization and ultimately her demise being in that system. So, and all she needed was water. So this is this is just what's really happening here. And there is nothing you can do in this country and talk about you're getting some freedom while slavery is legal. True. And let's just, you know, like channel their energy and spirit to guide us through this. Because they're looking, they're watching. We call on them. They're our ancestors now. You know what I mean? So yes. we need that help. We need that guide. I'm getting emotional. I, I've, I've been in that position where I was in tears multiple times in, in the past week. Oh, yeah. Especially for reaching the program because I understand. And when you understand the depth, the breath, the numbers, it's so overwhelming. It's, it's like you're literally fighting against the devil himself. Yeah. And you get to realize that the ancestors are there to help you. You're not alone. Yeah. They, that they, they are there for you. God is there for you. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's definitely been an emotional week, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> you know. Bear with you, I'd give you a hug and probably some COVID, but <laughs> I don't need all that. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. But yeah, I, I thank you for, for coming on and your insight and, and just letting the people know this is what you've been doing for a long time. And you were starting to see the light <laughs> at the end of the tunnel, as they say. And we just all need to join forces together because it's power in numbers. And we're going to start what this. said last night. Every week we listen to Frederick Douglass, uh, a part of his story, his life story. And we'll, we'll play Ozzy Davis reading. And last week, that's what he's saying, that we need to unify against a common enemy. And that everybody in this country is subject to slavery and oppression has to become soldiers of some sort. And if you can't pick up arms, you're going to have to figure out some other way that you can assist. Because this is a war, and it is a fight, and there are people dying and being enslaved. So, I usually give a tip of the week for the people, for the audience, and I kind of want to use this as a tip of the week. Get on your computer, your devices, and email abolitionistcenter at gmail.com so you can get involved. And just say, I want to help. And put your name, and someone will contact you. This is our life. Our life is at stake. And right now, what they're doing with this militarization bull, they can start implementing more stuff. So we have to be ready. We have to be ready. And as I said earlier, to, uh, again, quote Frederick Douglass, knowledge makes man or woman or child unfit to be a slave. So go to abolitiontoday.org and just 
pick one of the episodes that stands out for you. We talk about specific things, Sixth Amendment, the Eighth Amendment. We talk about the state of Mississippi, the state of Alabama. Anything that interests you, pick it up and listen. listen. And you will be surprised at the amount of knowledge that we're providing and real common sense logic uh, that puts the pieces together like a puzzle that you've been trying to find. Mm-hmm. And you will have those aha moments. I see now. He just enlightened me. I see it now. And then you're going to get pissed off and you're going to want to do something. So that's the thing. We got to push that button. We got to agitate you. We got to get you ready. Because this ain't over until it's over. So We have got some ashes to kick and some names to take. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, my brothers. Thank you for your time. I love you. Thank you, Kalita. I love you too, my sister. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate everybody tuning in today for No Address Podcast. Check out the documentary. It is on noaddressdocumentary.com. And there's a direct link there, or you can go to the XOD Network app. So we will see you next time. Peace and love.